You know, something that occurred to me, I was looking at my phone and I was looking at my camera, phone, camera, and I just realized my phone has only three buttons. Power button, volume up and down. Now, when I was looking at Z9, I counted 34 buttons and four dials. So is this good? Is this bad? I don't know. Let me know guys in the description below, in the comments below what you guys think. And tell me what camera do you use and how many buttons your camera has. Anyway, I digress. So let's talk about six very frequent mistakes that many beginner Nikon Z9 users make when use it for studio portraiture. Let's talk about that. Okay, so mistake number one. It is assuming that your previous strobes and flashes such as this one would work the same way on a Nikon Z9 as it used to work on your DSLR cameras. Now, the mistake that's being made is that when you are in camera and you go to your flash mode. Now, with DSLR cameras, all you have to do is just, you're gonna put your flash on top and you're good to go. But with the Z9, you actually have to go to the flash mode setting and you need to go from flash off to flash fill on. And this will actually will allow you to use your flashes the way they're supposed to work. And that is mistake number one. Mistake number two, assuming that your old triggers would work the same way as they used to work with your DSLR cameras. Now, unfortunately, that's not the case with every trigger and every company. In my example, I used to love using these pocket wizards, okay? They used to work so well with my DSLR cameras. I used to use my Pocket Wizard Mini TT1 on top of my camera and the Pocket Wizard TT5 on top of my strobe or flash. So when it comes to, when I switch my camera systems and I went to Z9, well, I learned that the protocol that's being used to trigger this triggers or signal to these triggers is not the same. So the mistake that many photographers make who start using Z9 is that they start selling off or getting rid of their flashes such as this one or maybe a strobes that I used to love using. And this is my trusted Alien B made by Paul C. Buff. And I still use them very, very effectively. And what I have done is this is how I went about to start using them again. So this is how I used my, the SB, I'm sorry, um, Alien B 800 along with my flashes. Let me show you the, the setup and that I used for one of my recent photo shoots that where I was hired to shoot uh, basically a bunch of classic, classic portraits and this is how it worked out. So here was my backdrop sitting on little tripod stands. Here was my subject. This is where my camera was set up on a tripod. Now, what I used is, I actually used this Godox X2T to trigger my fill light. Not the key light, but my fill light. And this is how it worked. This is the example of my Godox AD200 sitting on the C stand. And on top of this camera, I had the Godox X2T. And this is for Nikon, obviously. And here is the Z9. And I also use my key light. And a key light was actually my trusted Alien B with a 48 inch modifier sitting on a C stand. 
alien B 800. And this is actually how this works. Okay? Your Godox trigger sends a signal to Godox AD 200. And this is my field light. In return, when Godox AD200 receives a signal from the trigger, it sends the signal to Alien B. But the trick is with Alien Bs is that you want to make sure that your Alien B is set to an optical mode. You'll find on Alien B there is a. It's called a slave function okay when your alien B or actually any other light sent to a slave function when it's ready to receive a signal via the optical signal it will trigger at the same time so guys do not get rid of your flashes when you're switching to Nikon Z9 because it's not necessary all you have to get is one trusted trigger and the flash that will basically will be triggered and here is my AD200 and it will allow you to trigger all other flashes through the optical function. So that's a mistake number two that you don't want to make and it will save you some money. Okay, mistake number three. When you're shooting in a studio, sometimes we can make an assumption that your light is going to be consistent and... But the problem is if you're shooting in one permanent studio, you can certainly adjust your camera settings. You can set it and forget it. However, when you are shooting on the go and you have a portable studio, like in my case on this video, I was photo shooting a lot of couples, probably near uh, up to 20 couples, and the lighting was different. The lighting was changing in the room. Even though it was in the evening, it was still uh, some light coming in from outside the windows. Mistake that a lot of photographers make, beginner photographers make with using Z9, is that this is a phenomenal camera and you can make a lot of adjustments. But don't forget that shooting in RAW is still way to go. Here's an example of one of my image where I shot in RAW when basically not edited. And here's RAW edited um, image. So that's the difference that you would get when you're shooting in RAW. When you're shooting in JPEG, your colors are kind of baked in already into your image. And you want to avoid that because you want to have as much flexibility in post so that you can make adjustments necessary to get proper colors on people's faces, on the backdrop, and anywhere you need. That is a mistake number three. Mistake number four. Now, this mistake, not only for the Z9 users, but probably generally for many photographers who use any kind of camera, whether it's a DSLR or the Z9 or any Nikon or Sony or Fuji or Canon systems, is not using the proper background or backdrop for your work. Initially, when I was hired to do this work, I have purchased this backdrop, which is very has a spring type feel and I was going for something light because I knew that this is going to be during the springtime. But the more I was thinking, I realized that the photo shoot I was hired to do would be more for classic type of portraits. And I actually, last minute, I ended up going on Amazon and purchasing this backdrop by uh, seamless gray paper because I realized, and after looking at different examples as reference images, this is going to serve much better for my particular style and the theme that I was going for. So don't make these mistakes and pick any kind of a backdrop that you think may work for you. Get some advice, look at some reference images, and it will help you in the end and you'll be very happy with your final results. That is a mistake number four that you don't want to make with a Z9 or to the extent any other camera system. Mistake number five that a lot of Z9 owners beginners tend to make when you're studying when shooting in a studio environment now this is a phenomenal camera this camera can shoot up to 120 frames per second 60 frames per second and sometimes you want to be able to capture 
whenever you are trying to pose your clients because it's not always you get the expression and a pose that you want. So thinking, well, I'm gonna set my camera to 60 frames per second, to 120 frames per second, just to be able to capture any position and any movement I can. The mistake that's being made is that all of your triggers, most of your triggers and flashes, these do not, do not recycle at 120 frames per second. Now, the Z9, is a powerful camera. 120 frames per second, this is what it sounds like. The problem is your flashes are not going to recycle at 120 frames per second. Now, this is how you can correct your mistake. What I actually have done with a lot of my couples, as you can see in this video, right before they were about to take images, I have provided about 15 to 20 different images as references to them of different pose and different theme and how they can stand and how they can smile or not smile. And actually, this will help you expedite your process and you don't have to take as many pictures, as any images as you needed to. The key in this is to learn. It's more of a skill that you get to learn how to properly pose your couples. So here's an example of the one of the reference images that I have given to one of the couples. And here is an example of them actually pretty much trying to follow that example. Now, it's not exactly to the key. Obviously, people are different sizes, people different forms. But the idea is it gives them comfort and having an idea, oh, I can actually relate to this image. This is how I want to this is how I want to look in my professional photo. This is actually what I would want to hang on my wall at home once it's printed. Here's an example of another image that I used as a reference file, as a reference image to show to my clients. And this is what it looks like when they actually try to follow that advice or that reference image. It's not exactly the same, but it gives them an idea of what they could do and what they can expect once they're gonna see the final result. So that's a mistake number five. Don't assume that your powerful Nikon Z9 is gonna be able to shoot at 120 frames per second and be able to capture all of the images because your flashes do not recycle at the same speed as your camera can take those images. And the mistake number six. Now, it is an amazing camera. It is absolutely lovely camera. But a lot of mistakes that beginner photographers would make, and maybe we as YouTubers may assume, well, if you can afford this camera, therefore you should be able to afford any kind of lens, 2.8, f1.8, f1.2. When you are shooting in a portrait, um, in a studio environment, most of the time you will find yourself that you're shooting at f5.6, maybe up to f8. And therefore, getting a lens that can shoot at f1.8 or f2.8, it's not always practical. And you will find yourself most of the time, not always, but most of the time, stopping down to at least f4. So my advice, not to spend too much money on your new lenses if you can't afford, and it's okay to utilize your f-mount lenses because those f-mount lenses just as spectacular in many ways, specifically for photography, as the Z lenses. Now, what you want to be able to get is you want to get yourself a variable focal length, such as 24 to 70, maybe f4, because this will allow you to step back. When I was doing this photo shoot, depending how I was positioning people, depending how tall people might have been, sometimes there I had to move forward, closer, and even though I was using the uh, variable focal length 24 to 70 f 2.8 yes I use this uh, specific lens professionally for indoor for outdoor for many situations but if you're particularly using your photography in a studio type environment f4 lens will be most of the time sufficient for you so that's a mistake number six spending too much money on lenses when you don't need to because you will be stopping down to f4, f5.6, and even 
f8 to get the entire image in focus. So guys, I hope this video was helpful to you and you can avoid making those mistakes as a beginner, but maybe even as a professional and you've been shooting for quite a while in studio. Guys, please like and subscribe as I know it helps the algorithm to boost the videos and be able to spread to many other people. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next one.